Welcome back. This is Module 2. This is Microsoft Virtual Academy. We're talking today about XAML tooling, especially Blend, but we're looking right now at what the XAML tools are for Visual Studio. A lot of new things in Visual Studio 2013. Module 1, we talked about some of the core editing experience and a little bit of the coding experience inside C Sharp. We started talking about some of the tools in the tool, or some of the controls in the toolbox. We didn't get to the end. I want to make sure we at least cover some of those fun ones, then we'll go through this as well. So let's just look at where we are headed, though. Uh, the first thing we'll talk about in this module are the built-in templates. There's a whole bunch of templates for new projects. And well, not a whole bunch. That makes it sound like there's yeah, a lot. There's one. Five. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are also uh, new templates for um, uh, pages as well. We want to go through those and just make sure we have a grasp around each of them. We'll talk about some, some of the basics around migration if you have an 8.0 app. Of course, there's a lot of documentation already out there about that. Uh, we'll go through the devices panel. That's where we uh, started in the last module. And then some of the advanced features that really are geared towards making your XAML app awesome and uh, maybe how you can leverage those. And we'll just demo those at a, at a high level as well. But before we do anything, Uni, um, I want to remind everybody that the code that you and I are doing here, um, I mean, right now we're just dragging goofy things on, so that, that's not it. But the code that we're using as samples, sample code is all available to them at xaml.codeplex.com. Mm -hmm. So it's xaml, xaml.codeplex.com. And as we make changes through the rest of the modules, we'll be checking those in so you can get those as well. But they're already there as well, some of the completed ones that we'll be using as references if uh, anything in our demo goes wrong. Absolutely. And uh, all right, so let's, let me open up Visual Studio really quick. And uh, I'll have a, a new, I'll have had of a new, um, well, here, let me add it. I'll just add it to this one, and we'll remove it in just a second. Uh, because I want to show a few of the controls that we didn't have time to show in the last piece. So here's my toolbox. And in Windows 8.1, some, some of that have come in are really cool. And uh, there is, first of all, there are the flyouts. And we'll demo the flyouts in Module 5, where we will use those inside an app. But a flyout is basically just that thing that pops up. You know, sometimes you have a button in the command bar. It's just a tiny little button, and it's too small for you to really be able to use. You want to show one, two, three different sub items. How do you show those? You show it with a, a flyout. And so we have flyouts that attach to the button. You could have a menu uh, flyout, or you could have just a general flyout where you put anything that you want in there. Um, but what I want to show is the uh, the time picker. So we have a, a time picker and we have a date picker. Now, the reason we're showing this is not because these are revolutionary, but because they're new in Windows 8.1. And this is something that XAML developers were always needing to build on their own in, uh, in 8.0. And so we have both a time picker and a date picker. And they're fully bindable, so you can use all of the patterns that you want to. And it solves all the problems. And of course, we know that as you go from one um, one, one localized set to another, you know, not every country uh, puts the day second like we do. Sometimes it's in a different order. This handles that by reading the local information on the current user and reordering it the way it needs to be for them. Uh, the other one that uh, we didn't get to, a chance to show was the, um, what was the other one? Oh, in the, in the text box. So here's a text box. Uh, we've always had text box. It's pretty uh, simple, we know, but um, what's great about it is it's, it's pretty much 100% the case that any developer who uses a text box has to add it to a stack panel that includes a text block because they want to add some sort of text that I want you to type a, your um, first name, but now I need to have some sort of header on it so that you know that that's the first name. And so now we have header built into the text box. So if I go to the property of the text box over here, I can, uh, I can go down to, I'll just search for it real quick. Here's the header, and I can say it need, this is the first name. What's great about this is if developers use this header rather than their own, um, from app to app to app, users are going to have a very repeat, repetitive, familiar experience as they see uh, you know, forms over data. Uh, another neat thing is you can see it says text box. That's because that's the default data in the text property right now. So I'll go down to text. I'll see that. And I could clear it so it doesn't have uh, you know, goofy data. But uh, I still might want to prompt them, you know, what do they mean by first name? Does that include my, my title, doctor, or something like that? So now I can go into the placeholder text, which is right here below it. And I can say this is, uh, you know, for Dr. Smith, or that, that's probably the worst first name ever. But it allows me to have this watermark that goes away when the user goes in and gives it focus. But it gives them a little bit more guidance so you don't have to worry about pop-ups or anything to help the user put the correct data in. So anyway, these are some of the subtle things, but they're really powerful as well as far as removing complexity around your XAML and using some of these built-in features. Yeah. 
there we are. Let's go to the new project types and uh, kind of walk through those. Absolutely. So if you don't mind switching to my monitor. All right. So I'm going to take you through um, you know, what I'd call like the anatomy of a, of a simple project template. So mm -hmm. I can, we can sort of walk through the pieces that sort of uh, you know, are, 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 are essential to sort of getting this basic app up and running. But before we go that, I wanted to sort of walk you through the new project dialog in Visual Studio. Uh, um, if you are like, and by the way, like you can create projects in Blend as well. I'm just using Visual Studio because I, I'm going to show you some code to see how these things actually work. Mm -hmm. uh, you have templates that are consistent across Visual Basic, uh, Visual C++, and Visual C Sharp as well. In nice. this case, uh, I'm going to use C Sharp because that's the language I'm most comfortable with. Um, we have um, added one new template, which is the hub app for doing the hub pattern, as is evident uh, in the preview on the right-hand side here. Perfect. So if a developer saw you last module show the hub, and they're like, nice, I like it. Now how would I ever implement it? They could start here. Yeah, and we're going to take a look at that in a second. But most developers that I actually know of, once they know the basics of the platform and patterns and things like that, they prefer to start from scratch and add content as they see appropriate. So that's perfectly fine as well. For that, we have the blank app as well as a couple other templates like the grid and split. We had the grid before and the split before. What's new here is, is hub. hub. So you're saying yeah. that I could use grid, hub, and split as a learning experience. That's right. So in addition to these templates, which are sort of your app templates, we also have class library. So you can share mm. code across multiple apps or even within the same app. You can refactor your code to be reusable across apps. Uh, uh, across do, C Sharp apps. Across C Sharp apps. And in, in, if you were to create a Windows runtime component, you could reuse that across C Sharp. And, ah, you know, so that's the class library across all the languages. That's correct. Yeah, Windows runtime, as you know, um, allows the developer to write code that runs across uh, yeah. languages in some ways, like by exposing their types as WinRT types. So you could do that as well. But generally, people sort of tend to stick to the language that they write in. Yeah. So it's primarily for refactoring your app. So, that so if I'm writing a library of controls or code that's for me, and I always write in the same language, then a class library. Is fine. probably perfectly fine. And then portable class libraries is this concept for mm. sharing code across multiple XAML platforms. So if you wanted to share code, if you're if you're a developer writing a WPF app and want to share significant assets in terms of your backend or something like that with your Windows Store app, you'd consider using a portable class library. So all these templates are there. Uh, in addition, there are a couple of test templates as well to allow you to test your app. But let's go ahead and create a hub app and okay. take a look at what's 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 really in this particular template. Before we even do anything, let's go ahead and run it to see how it looks like. Yeah, great idea. That's pretty cool. Right out of the box, it yeah, immediately. Yeah, you, you do nothing. Ready. Create a new project, run it. You have your basic hub pattern. Of, um, let me just get rid of this thing. You have your basic app pattern up and running. Hmm. Uh, you click on a particular section. You can add more data about that particular item that you just clicked on. Mm -hmm. um, if you uh, on if the general Windows pattern requires you to sort of put this chevron up here over the section if your section has more data that goes behind it. So I can click on a section. I can see more data about that particular section. So I have like a hero item, and then I have like other mm -hmm. items that sort of display more information about that particular section as well. So this is sort of your. Now, that little sideways chevron is built right in as a feature of the hub control. That's correct. You don't cool. need to do anything there. It's all built in, so that's all good. Pretty cool. So that's your basic hub app. Like it's it's pretty functional out of the box. Go ahead and start adding some content. You can submit it to the store. Absolutely. Like <laughs> it's, it it passes all validations and things like that. We'll talk about that in a little little bit as well. But let's take a quick look at what makes the hub app. Hmm. So really, this app, if I was to sort of break it down for you, consists of three different pages. There is the home page, the hub page that contains all of the hero images and sections and things like that. Uh, let's go ahead and open it. Uh, so that's sort of your sort of your 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 starting page for your app. Let me right. just zoom out a little bit so you can see everything. So that's your your hub page. Um, you select different sections, and you can see like different sections over there. All of them showing some data at different nice. times. So yeah. you can work against that data. Uh, the item page is for a particular item that you click down. So there's some navigation. I'm sorry. There's some navigation that gets triggered when you click on a particular item that mm -hmm. takes you to the particular page that shows more details about the item, and you can add more content to this page. And then there is the section page, which, which when you click on a particular hub section that has more items, nice. we take you to the page. So it's a three-page application. There's some navigation hooked up for you. So let's start. Let's see how that really works. Uh, App.xaml is sort of your application object, the object that always exists when your app is running. And it controls the entry point into your app. It controls things like state that you can persist across multiple pages in your app and things like that. 
Let's go ahead and open app.xaml.cs. The thing to note here is um, it's, it's a simple event-driven model. There's a constructor that gets run. The constructor hooks up some event handler so that your mm -hmm. app can respond to uh, Windows events like uh, when your app gets suspended and things like that. Um, there is the on-launched handler that gets called when your app is ready to do something. And in the on-launched handler, along with a whole bunch of other things that we won't get into today, you basically trigger the navigation to the home page of your app. Okay, so that so, bottom line is the initial location that we go to. That's correct. It? And oh. that's really the type of the hub page over here. So if I open up the hub page um, and go to the root, there is an X colon class here. That's the name that you're kind of using to trigger navigation to the particular page to okay. start with. So that's your app.xaml.cs. It does a whole bunch of other things like hooking up event handlers. When your app sort of crashes, you want to do error handling and report uh -huh. the error to the user, you know, or, or, or error conditions and things like that. You can handle all of that in your app.xaml.cs. Nice. Um, your app.xaml is also the place where you would add resources, like we discussed in the earlier section, that are global to the app. Uh -huh. If you wanted to use a brush across multiple pages, this would be one particular location where you could put the brush and still use it across so we're really talking pages. about scope. You put it here, it's scoped to That's everything. Correct. And the most common pattern that we see people use is they kind of create resource dictionaries for all their brushes and colors and fonts and styles, and they link into application resources the most common ones. Mm -hmm. Now, we totally recommend that you do not link in everything into your application. You just link in things that you need. Okay. Uh, just to not make sure that your app starts up fast. Uh, but it's perfectly valid to sort of link in everything into app.xaml if you're just talking like a small set of resources. All your text really blocks use. look the same. Exactly. Like yeah. Okay. Kind of reminds me of a CSS file right. in a lot of ways. So, so what we have seen so far is we have seen the application object that triggers, triggers navigation to the hub page. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple other important parts to this app as well that's located in the common folder. The common folder contains, I would say, like three important things that are really relevant to the XAML developer. There is Navigation Helper, which is sort of a service that we provide you to allow you to sort of stay, save your state and load your state back up again when the user is sort of navigating across pages. Similarly, um, uh, it's, it's, um, you really want your apps to be keyboard accessible, right? So you want the user to press the, the, the right key and trigger to the next page and the previous page and so on and so forth, the back right. key hookup. This, this particular helper class library provides a bunch of useful functionality that allows you to do these sort of things in your app. Uh, now, this is, a, this is a type of helper class I could easily pull out of this project, put it into my project, and start using Oh, absolutely. It. I mean, it's, we're it's, not saying a developer can't write this from scratch as well. There's nothing in here that's magic that right. you know, we've right. done. We, just we want to make sure easy. that the apps that we build out of the box on Virus Studio comply with the Windows guidelines all the way through and through, including accessibility as well as, you know, as, you, as you're aware, if your app is consuming a lot of resources, your Windows might kill your app if the user is not actively interacting with the app. Um, it's recommended that when such a thing happens and when the user decides to go back to their app to restart their work, we don't put them back into the, the home page of the app, uh -huh. and we instead leave them in the page that the user sort of left off. Um, so, so such functionality can be easily hooked up by using these helper class libraries. So if I was to go back to hubpage.xaml, and take a look at the code behind, you will see that we are creating an instance of uh, the navigation helper over here in the constructor, and we are sort of passing in a reference to the page. That's all you need to do, and everything mm -hmm. else is then taken care of for you. Uh, we also um, could optionally hook into the load state. Mm. So if your app was expecting some st state to get dehydrated um, when the app resumes, that's where you would sort of do your actions, and we would call you back with the data that you want to rehydrate your app with. Uh, okay, so this goes back to the process lifecycle. If, if my app is about to be suspended, I might want to save it off so that the, when the user comes back, it's all there again. This is the load state. There's an equivalent save state as well. That's correct. And all of these are actually functionality that is provided by this class over here, which is called Suspension Manager. Mm, yeah. um, if you built an app in Windows 8, this is an artifact that you're already familiar with. Uh, this is an artifact that allows you to do things like saving and restoring your data. So think about it this way. The page calls into the navigation helper, which in turn calls into suspension manager to do some work yeah. for it. So that's the, the way the page the, helper the is up. an instantiated helper, and the suspension manager is a static helper. That's correct. And the third most important component of this particular template is your data source, right? In this case, we have some data, which mm. is which is which is just a simple hierarchy of classes. So there is sample data. It is gray boxes after all. Exactly. It's it's pretty simple. much, yeah. There is sample, there is a there is a what 
a, a pseudo view model here, um, a group, and an item. So mm -hmm. the, 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 the pseudo view model contains a set of groups, and the set of groups contains a set of items. Um, all we do is we, we, we read this JSON file when the app is running, we hydrate our view model, and then we sort of like visualize that in your app, so to speak. Okay. Right? So, so that's sort of like your basics of how you sort of load data. Now in a real world scenario, you would not load any data when the app is launched. You would sort of asynchronously get the data. That's all baked into the sample data source. You can use this as a pattern for building your view models if you want. Um, so if I go to uh, this class over here, get sample data async, as you know, it's, we have already built it to be async even though we could do this synchronously and nobody would notice a thing. We are getting data asynchronously just as a, as a best practice. So when, uh, when a call is made to get items async, we have an async function that actually reads the data, the mm -hmm. JSON file, so the app, the UI thread never blocks, right, as the data is getting fetched. And this becomes more and more relevant in a services world where we are actually getting data from a service. So, right. so that's the way we would populate the data. Just rest of it is just simple JSON parsing and population yep. of your data structures. Um, and uh, sample data, this is what it does at runtime. That's not how it actually gets the code that you see at design time. Uh, we'll talk about design time data and sample data soon, but uh, that you, what you were showing was a runtime solution. That's correct. And uh, when we go into the data section, we will actually show you some tips and tricks that you can use to better visualize your, your objects at design time. So you can actually see some data here as well. So just to sort of touch on this template before we wrap up this section, um, if you take a look at the hub section over here, and I scroll a little bit to the right, you see this annotation in here called D colon data context, which is what we call design time data context. Uh, we'll we'll touch, and touch this topic when we talk about the data section, uh, when, we, when we go into the data section. But nonetheless, this D colon data context is primarily useful for specifying your data context as, at design time, so you can see some objects and work against them. So if you want to do some styling, and your data is coming from some service, you mm -hmm. may not have access to the data when your code is running inside Visual Studio. Yeah. We have built-in constructs that allow you to visualize objects at design time and only at design time. So there's get no out of the way at runtime. Exactly. There's no impact to your running app. You're sort of populating, in this case, some sample data. In this case, it so happens that the same JSON file is used at design time and runtime, but these could be completely different JSON files that's fetching different data yeah. um, in some cases from a service. Yeah. I guess it's possible that you might be fetching in both, but it's not an, that's, yeah, that's an edge Pretty case. much. And then the rest of it is simple hookup. So if you will notice that there is, um, if you go to in, in, in hubpage.zaml.cs, there is uh, event handler for hooking up the click. So when the user clicks on a hub section header, so let's go take a quick look at that. Uh, here's the section header that has like, you can see there is a chevron here. Um, and uh, we have hooked up the click event handler somewhere over here. Um, that sort of like allows the user to click uh, right over here. Um, click on an item or a header and then respond to that particular click and do some things, right? So in this case, I'm hooking up to the item click event. If I go to my hub page.zaml.cs, there's my item click event. When so the click the, happens, I'm navigating to a page. So the, this, these templates are really, they're, they're excellent templates and starting points for developers who have no idea where they're going, right? I mean, you may already, if you, for example, had, uh, you know, Uni's MVVM platform, whatever it was, that's the one that you prefer. Well, you might actually start with blank and go from there. But if you're really looking for guidance and some best practices, these templates are set up particularly for that. That's and, correct. And th honestly, there are some things that you might actually want to pull over anyway. Uh, right. This navigation helper, as it, when you pull that over, it gives you more accessibility. And there's also a relay command, which is an MVVM concept, so you can handle click events without having to handle click events. Yeah. And, uh, and then you also have that suspension manager, which if you wrote your own suspension manager, it's going to look almost exactly like this one as well. So those three files alone are pretty worthy of bring, being brought into any application. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at this template, it's actually doing a lot of heavy lifting that you would commonly do in your app. So you certainly can use this as a starting point and then just hook up, replace the sample data source object yeah. with my data source object that's fetching data from some service. And then you have your basic hub app with real data up and running in no time. Perfect. Now, let's take a concept just for a moment. Let's pretend I've, I've got my application written for 8.0. And I just want to think at a high level. What am I thinking about as far as migration? I want to, first, is it worth it going from 8.0 to 8.1? Absolutely. I think it makes total sense. I mean, as you know, 8.1 is a free upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, 
you probably want to think about this from a consumer angle first. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you have um, significant advances that Windows 8.1 brings to the table. So as the consumer, you're sort of incentivized to use Windows 8.1. Yeah. And then as a developer, you, are, you have a double incentive. You have a platform that's more performant, yeah. that has more capabilities, the tools are better, and so on and so forth. So it brings, um, it, it's really a compelling um, use case that sort of, uh, you know, drives you to sort of use 8.1 features over time, yeah. you know? I mean, when you look at the, like side by side, if you think about the new features in 8.1, they're pretty great, but if you look at performance improvements in 8.1, it, it might even outweigh all the new yeah, API features. Absolutely, I mean, uh, all, if, if all you did was take your app, did no changes to it, just rebuilt it as 8.1, yeah. your app is like 10% faster because we now sort of have this new feature where we compile your XAML into XBF and things yeah, like that. Yeah. So, so you get performance out of the gate. Your controls are faster, your, everything is just faster by just doing nothing, literally recompiling. If I'm, now, a, if I'm a store developer and I'm worried, I'm like, well, you know, all my users may not be on 8.1 yet, you can deploy them both. Oh, absolutely. The store is sort of capable of sort of, you know, maintaining two versions of your app and then serving the right app to the right audience. Um, so there is absolutely, yeah. you know, the, the use case there as well. Now, the, now, like, like I said, just recompiling gets your performance, but now you start sort of like taking advantage of some of the features as well. So for yeah. example, the grid view in Windows 8.1 um, is designed to sort of handle large data sets and at the same time maintain great frame rates as the user is fastly panning through data. Yeah. Right? So, so these kinds of things you can start taking advantage of by doing some little bit of extra work on top of your, of your existing app. So we've seen examples where by just making like maybe like two hours of investments in your app, your app gets like 100% faster. You wow. Know? So, so it really comes down to, I guess, how bad your app was written to start with, yeah. and in some cases, the platform improvements as well. So sure. put together, I think there's, there's a lot of value in sort of migrating to Well, and, you know, I mean, we always show demos with 15 items in the grid. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's a small number. Uh, you know, you think about a line of business application or just a, just Netflix, you know, it's just applications with a lot of data where 15 items, they have 15,000 items, 150,000. I mean, you know, they've got so many that they are scrolling through. And so if those were issues for you, that is another. Absolutely, I mean, you have to be smart as a developer as to, as to the choices you make. Yeah. Like, is, oh, is, it, is it the use case that the user is gonna go through 15,000 items or is it the Never. use case that the user is gonna go to 300 items? I think it's yeah. more likely that you want to sort of add some level of virtualization where you don't sort of even load that data. Yeah. But at the same time, there is absolutely a use case where you want to show hundreds of items and the user is sort of quickly navigating through them. For that particular use case, actually, we've made a lot of improvements in the platform to make it easy for you to pan through your data sets. Sure. Well, in, uh, in the previous module, we kind of hinted at the device panel. It's a, probably one of the most powerful things that we have. Um, let's open it up. Let's look at it in Blend, even. Let's, Absolutely. Uh, and see what the device panel offers. Um, I'll talk just for a second about the windowing in 8.1. So sure. in 8.0, we had windowing where uh, your app had three possible states. It could either be portrait, landscape at full, or it could be snap, this 320 pixel wide, very narrow area. Now, in Windows 8.0, we've changed that. So 8.1. In Windows 8.1, thank you. We've changed that so that your application has a variable size. The user can kind of decide how wide your app goes all the way down to 500 pixels. And then that 500 pixels is the minimum that any application has to support. You can still opt in to be a 320 wide pixel um, app if that's important to you. Uh, that's absolutely, it, it fits certain scenarios. Um, oh, of course, you can still be portrait as well. So that, all that variability, I still wanna be able to visualize some of that inside Visual Studio or inside Blend. This is where the device panel really shines. Yeah. So uh, before we switch to device panel, I wanted to show you, you can right click on a XAML page um, and you can sort of say open and blend and we will sort of load blend ah, with nice. the right solution loaded, the project loaded and the XAML file open so as well. So blend is not a page viewer, it, it opens the entire solution. Yeah, so blend's a, uh, just so folks uh, who don't know about blend, blend's a, blend's a design focused tool. Mm -hmm. It's a part of Visual Studio, you get Visual Studio, you do get blend, it's yep. not an optional install. Um, you, you have, the same set of XAML platforms supported in Blend as in Visual Studio. So Visual Studio has support for WPF and Civilite and Windows Phone. Blend also has the same platforms, depending upon the SKU of Visual Studio that you have. Okay. And Blend offers a lot more richer functionality for customizing your app. Since we were talking about the device panel, let's just focus on that for a second and look at some of the features that the device panel exposes to you, the XAML developer, to optimize your app for Windows. Okay. 
So let's go through all of these settings and I'll sort of call out some of these settings when they are distinct between Windows 8 and Windows 8.1. So like we discussed in the last module, the display setting is used to simulate your app um, at, um, at, at different DPI settings. It's, it's, now of course, if you're familiar with XAML, you, you pretty much get dynamic layout of the box, use a grid, and then everything sort of automatically stretches, everything is all good, right? But there is another thing that you should be really careful about when you're designing a Windows 8.1 app or a Windows app in general, a Windows Store app. Um, your app is designed to run all the way from like, you know, crappy 96 display DPIs by modern standards yeah. to display displays that go as much as like 400 DPI. Like that's going to be pretty common going forward, right? So, so, so not only do we want to sort of make sure that your layout sort of scales correctly and resize, your app resizes correctly, um, you also want to make sure that you specify assets. When I say assets, I really mean scalar assets, images and things like that, yeah. at different scale factors. Windows has a mechanism built in that allows you to sort of see uh, your images at different scale factors. Mm. And you want to make sure that your app already has asset classes that it specifies. There are four or five classes you can specify. You can specify like 100% scale, 140, 180, and things like that. So don't ship just uh, poor quality at images that look great on a small device. Yeah. Ship also really nice images as well. But don't just ship the nice ones either because then you're giving yeah. up memory for nothing on Absolutely. devices that can And can't this is where classic it. design comes in, right? Like you often Windows will do the right thing of scale. Let's say you were to ship the highest quality asset every single case. Yeah. Windows does the right thing of scaling the asset down as required. Mm -hmm. But as a designer, you may not always want that. Like yeah. you want to sort of have absolute control of your pixels in a lot of cases. And that's the I place do. where you want to sort of like, you know, specify multiple asset classes and things like that. So that drop down showed uh, all all kinds of different uh, physical sizes as well as the resolution size as well. So you can go through both to see the scaling of assets as well as what happens when I have this grid and I'm on a 27 inch device. That's correct. Well, the, the default project template does not have, um, you know, just has like the 100% assets. Mm -hmm. But if you had like assets that were corresponding to one of these other form factors here, we would show that on the design surface as you make tweaks as well. Nice. So you can preview not only for your scale, uh, your, your layout scaling, you can also preview different classes of assets as well Very nice. uh, at different scale factors. Uh, then of course there is the orientation which allows you to preview your app. And of course the hub app does not show very well uh, unless I select a different section. Uh, so probably not the right pattern to use out of the box in this particular case. No uh, but you can sort of preview your app as it looks like. But it is um, great because sometimes I, I think developers think, okay, now I've got to write five different versions of my app to handle every orientation. Now I can come into the device panel here and switch it around and say, hey, some of these controls naturally kind of morph and handle this and kind of it's a responsive design that these controls already have built in and allows you to see it right here even if you don't have a device that you can turn and see it as portrait. Yeah, mode. I mean, you get responsive design by default, but at the same time, you could also use the states panel to control precisely right. uh, how your controls and appear and which order and things like that. So, so both of those are vi viable choices as well. You can just leave it up to the platform to do the right thing in the majority of the cases, or precisely control what controls appear in which layout as you, as you want to. Uh, okay, so moving on, um, the edge setting of the device panel allows you to preview, oops, let me just, oops, that's... That's interesting. Yeah, that, let me auto-hide the app bar. Uh, uh, hold, uh, hold space. <laughs> Isn't that the that Oh, there we go. Too? Okay, yeah. great. See, it's like... Oh, no, oh, look, yeah. There we go. So <laughs> let me just zoom in a little bit. Um, the edge setting um, in the in device panel allows you to preview your, your app at different, uh, you know, um, modes where... Where they of, may have dragged exactly. it to, sure. So in this case, um, you, you want to see your app as to how it looks like when the user has some other app docked on the right-hand side. Yeah. And uh, your app is sort of like getting the remainder of the space. Now, one good thing is you can also... The app on the right-hand side could also be designed to be freely resizable, not a 320px app. Yeah. So you can sort of preview how your app looks like by just resizing the, the design time handle. Nice. So you can see, now it looks okay, like there's a drop down in that little uh, yeah, you tip can, that shows. Absolutely. Up. You, can, you can say, okay, I want to preview my app as to how it looks like with 800px, and that's how the app looks like. 
uh, when the actual layout size is 800 pixels um, and things like that, right? And you can choose amongst. Oh, very nice, um, just to snap to yeah, it really quick. Exactly, if you, if you want to sort of like not worry about like a whole bunch of settings there. Um, you could see how your app looks like when two apps are docked, right? So in this uh -huh. case, you have an app that's on the right-hand side, and there's an app on the left-hand side as well. Um, you could do the same kind of thing. You can sort of resize your app. You can say, select a bunch of settings and, you know, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. I, I pause you just for a second. If, in, if, if there's not a common question I get, it's this one is um, uh, why, why is my app not able to, why can't I have all the apps side by side like you do on all of your demos? And it's almost always resolution. So what you just showed, two apps side by side and yours in the middle, or two apps on the edge and yours in the middle, that's really going to be based on the resolution of your device and whether or not it supports it. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it looks a little weird, right? Like, because you just have like a, like a normal, like, but what happens if you have like a really high, DPI display, like you get more pixels, uh, actually, yeah. more effective pixels, right? That's what we show over here. You can jack this up all the way to a really high value, and that's still a viable platform or a, or a display for your app to be running on. Yeah. And you need to make sure that your design is sort of such that it can work against this diverse set of displays that we will see in the near future come out of, you know, um, uh, of the yeah, I think it's just from a practical point of view, it's worthwhile telling developers that it, you should look at your app like this too, because that's correct. You want your app to look great on, I don't bad low end devices as well as extremely high end devices too. Especially high end devices, mm -hmm. they're the most likely they're going to buy your app. Absolutely. Um, the next setting that's important uh, to know about is, um, is this thing uh, for high contrast. It's important that your apps are accessible. Yeah. A lot of users have accessibility issues that they want to use your app. Um, you can see your app as it looks like in different accessibility settings. So in this case, I've selected, just to be clear, like you cannot control the accessibility setting. The user does it through the Windows control panel. Um, your app oh, just so has to. So I can't to... stop them from doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Like you, you absolutely cannot, and you must for, for your app to be certified by a large number of government agencies, your app must be accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and that means like you cannot sort of like say, okay, I don't really care, I'm gonna hard code all those values. It's in your best interest to be to build an accessible app as well. Help me understand, um, uh, I, so I go into, I go into uh, Windows and set my ex ex accessibility. Um, how are the, in this case, how are the values changing to yellow? Um, that's a system theme brush that automatically gets picked up. So if I was to select the hub section, you can see like the the, the, the foreground panel already is sort of like, um, it's coming from the style that's applied to the particular text block. Mm -hmm. So if I was to navigate to the text block that sort of is contributing to this look and feel, um, let's take a look at the style over here. Uh, let me edit the hub section real quick sure. and select this particular text block. Um, you can see like it's it's picking up the style so let's say, in this case, of course, I don't have, uh, uh, you can see like it's, it's this body text block style. Yeah. It's coming from Windows and it's already hooked up to a, to a brush resource that knows how to adapt itself to different uh, high contrast settings. I see. So it's, it's one of how those could I, How could I change that color? Let's pretend that I wish all my text were pink when it's not in high contrast. Yep. Um, but I don't want to make it so high contrast doesn't work anymore. Is there a step I should go through to make sure I can have both a custom color and support. Yeah, you could potentially uh, use theme resources where you uh -huh. could essentially have multiple dictionaries in your app that specify to multiple theme specifications. Yeah. So you could have a theme specification for your dark setting of your app or your light setting of your app or for high contrast as well. And then it's that theme that gets swapped out when it needs to be That's high contrast. Correct. And then as long as you kind of maintain consistency of brushes across these multiple themes as far as names are concerned and just continue to use them, yeah, you just get that out of the box, right? So that that just um, is. So if you're setting the color by hand on every text block manually, you're probably doing it wrong because you're at least foregoing this. Yeah, advantage. it totally depends on the scenario. There are some scenarios where you want to sort of hard code your colors, mm -hmm. but text is primarily a scenario that's that's really sensitive to high contrast settings and things like that. So you want to be a little careful when you sort of use one of these. Okay. You know, in most cases, you can get away with using one of these system-specified text block styles. That way, you get consistency with some of the other Windows apps. Not, not that that's the only way to do it, but you could do that, and then you could overwrite certain things as you so desired. Got it. Um, then we let's take a quick look at some of those other panels as well. Let, let me switch back to the default things so I can show uh, the the apps settings. Um, so, so by default, when you create a project template, it's yeah. designed to run with the dark theme. Sure. But that doesn't mean that's the only theme that's supported. Kind of a Batman theme. Exactly. You can you can you can switch to the light theme. Um, and when I run this app, you'll notice that the app still is using uh, the the light theme, uh, the dark theme, because I've not. This is this is not a setting. 
um, uh -huh. that, that, that's an OS specific setting. This is a setting that, that the app developer needs to make. So if I go back to Visual Studio real quick. This is, a, this is view only. Yeah, if I go back to Visual Studio, it's an app-wide setting, but you need to set that uh, through the requested theme attribute on the application object. If I set this, I get a couple of values, dark and light. I do not get high contrast because that's not something you can opt into. Okay. That's something that the user opts into via, via the operating system settings. Okay. But certainly you can select between light and dark if you wanted to build, let's say, the mail app. It probably makes sense to have you know, sort of like white background and dark text yeah. versus the other way around, right? So, so you can certainly do that now as well. Now, you're requesting the theme here at the app, uh, app level. I think it's, uh, from a scope point of view, it's worth mentioning that you can request the theme now in 8.1 at the app level for all of your pages, at the page level, at the stack panel Absolutely. level, at the, I mean, anywhere along the tree that you need to now. And that, that was a really big deal when you would have a dark app, but you would have a light theme settings dialog that popped up. And so you would want, everything would, wouldn't show up, so you'd have to go and Yeah, in Windows 8.1, there's a property on framework element called request a theme. Mm -hmm. that you can set at any level of the tree, and you can s alter the look and feel of yeah. that particular level of the tree to be something else, like Jerry says, right? That makes total sense. Um, when, you, when you made this change, and if you sort of mouse over this, I don't know why this thing, the focus probably is not working, you should see a tooltip that says, hey, you know what, you made this change, it's not really a good change to make, I mean, I guess I changed this in Visual Studio, but if it did not, uh, you would sort of say, uh, you know, that hey, you, you need to make this change in your code as well for it to reflect at runtime. Got it. Uh, the minimum width, width setting of your app is uh, is sort of like the setting that you would sort of make to sort of opt into a particular scenario, and this sort of plays together with the edge settings, mm -hmm. where your app can only go into a specific uh, size ratio. If you sort of say, hey, I want my app to just uh, you know, right. Use so this if you model. were back at the edge setting, you were dragging that around, it would stop at 500 unless you selected 320 here. That little warning dialogue is saying, this is fun.